I would like to share with you what drip irrigation can do in order to help the food security and the climate change. So all, we all know the population is growing and by mid-century we're going to have three times more people than what we have now and we need to feed them and the way it goes today it will not be enough. The water supply is less than needed, okay, we, we are lack of water and you see in a minute that uh, we need to play different. Energy supply is going down, Arab land is not enough to create enough food for the people the way it's going now. The food prices are going high and when we talk about food security there's a big issue. If we will make agriculture the same as we do today, there will not be enough food in 2050. So let's see what, what can be done about it. When we talk about irrigation, the agriculture takes 70% of the water amount of fresh water. 70%. Out of this, unfortunately, only 4% is irrigated with drip irrigation. 80% is irrigated with flood irrigation, which is the most inefficient way. Okay, 50% of the water that you flood are going away. The drip irrigation is 95%. So if we save a little amount of water in agriculture, we can double the amount of water for domestic needs. This is a water stress map in the world. And you see in some places we talk about real stress, if it's Israel, when we talk about it in a minute, or India, or Egypt, or many countries in Africa. There's not enough water. When we talk about Israel, it's arid climate. 60% uh, of it is about desert, okay, less than 300 millimeters of rain. Uh, we have limited natural water resources, we have very short winter, only four months with water, and that's it, the water is not stable. So we must come with some good idea in order to make agriculture. So we said that necessity is the mother of innovation, and, and these things were brought in Israel, it's hard for salt ore, it's the disc on key that now is inside, and also the drip irrigation back in 64. So drip irrigation is 50 years old, in some places it's still new, but it's, uh, it's very old. What is the main idea? The drip irrigation, we irrigate the plant and not the soil. When you irrigate with flood or sprinkler irrigation, the water are moving like a piston. They push everything away slowly, slowly. There's no air, there's no nutrition. Only the water front is coming ahead. When we talk about drip, we talk about the onion shape. The onion shape you see here, the only place that is really, really saturated with water is here in the middle. All the rest is kind of have some air and some nutrition has place in it. So this is a very big difference between flood and drip. You see here, we irrigate the plants. You can see the uniformity of the irrigation in this picture. And we don't irrigate the full area, we just irrigate the plants. Unlike what you see here. When you grow rice like this in flood irrigation conditions, everything is covered with water. And there's a lot of gas emission that is created. Methane and N2O created in a very big amount. 300 times more than what you do with drip irrigation. So when we talk about climate change and gas emission, growing rice in this way is a problem. There's many kind of machine for irrigation. Most of them will need high pressure, high energy cost. And uh, if you have wind, it will not be very efficient. We can work with 2.5 meter pressure and even less. We call it low pressure system. And the idea is to reduce the price of the system and the running cost. When we talk about contamination of groundwater, and it's very uh, good for Holland and all very good in other places like in Australia and Queensland, they have sure we can close to the, to the sea, the Great Barrier Reef, big amount of nitrogen leaches down and uh, make a very big destruction to this area. Now when we work with drip irrigation, we can work in a teaspoon feeding. We know exactly how much the plant needs in each stage and we apply small amount. We never make a very big bank in the soil that will go down and be washed away. So this is a very big difference, and we can save a lot of fertilizer like this. This is typical drip irrigation layout. You can see the water source. You can see some pump. Filtration is very important, otherwise it's not working. And we have some fertigation, fertilizer. Water without fertilizer will not give the same, the same thing. For us, topography is not an issue. We can grow any, any angulated area that you want. You can see the picture in Japan, China, and also in Israel. And in flood irrigation, you cannot do it because we have compensated dripper, which give the same amount of water regardless the slope. Again, topography is not an issue. This is in China. Uh, drip irrigation it started in Israel in the desert. This is Chatserim. This is, you see on the left side, this is Kibbutz Chatserim where the drip was invented. And this is the way it looks today. So we say the drip can change the desert. Sorry. 
This is the Arafat Desert in Israel. This is the way it looks. And you see later some pictures from the same place, what the different drip irrigation can make. This is in, in China, in Xinjiang province. You see the salinity of the soil, and this is one of the problems we're going to touch in a minute. But again, we can do with drip irrigation six that we cannot do in any other places. So what are the main problem is salinity. Okay, we have no rain to leach down the, the, the salt. We have salt that is salinity, we have water saline. Uh, the osmotic potential differences between the water in the soil and the plant the, is not available for the plant. The plant has to fight very difficult to ever to push, to pull the water to him. And we talk about electric conductivity, which is a threshold, how much we can, we can take. I will not go all, all, uh, all into it, but in general, uh, w whenever the salt concentration is increasing, we have reduction in yield, okay? And we, go, we know exactly the numbers for these sensitive crops and these non-sensitive crops, and we can talk about it later. So we see here, what are the EC? EC is electric, electric conductivity, we can check it, we can measure it. And we know that if you have less than 0.7, it's no problem, but if you have more than three, we have a problem how much water we should leach in order to overcome it, okay? Because if I give like 20, 30% more water, I can push the salt away. And uh, this is very important to remember because then we know how to deal with it. Again, the reduction of yield is very linear, okay? More saline, there will be more reduction of yield. Again, this is relative uh, tolerance of uh, salinity in different crops, so we can get sensitive, moderate, tolerant and, and very moderate. Let's say that cotton and tomatoes and date palms are very strong, they're very tolerant, and all the other crops are so so. Uh, what are the solutions for this problem? So we need to treat the water. We don't need to treat all the water, we can treat part of it and then we can dilute it, okay? So we make some desalination or other procedure and we dilute the saline water. We have to talk about leaching to wash away the salt. We can make some modification in soil, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and we should be very much aware about the water table because in some places the salinity creates because the water table is high, the evaporation is strong, and then we have accumulation of salts on the upper layer. So by drip we can control the amount of water we, we push down. We don't have to push it too much. And the desert is not forgiving for mistakes. If you have a big mistake, it, the plant will do. That's why I was mentioning about making like soil modification. So in, in soil that there's nothing to do with, we, we can have trenches, we put some other uh, soilless media and we can grow in this, uh, in this soil. This is in the Aravad Desert, as I showed before, this picture is in a Moshav, in Enyav. You see that the drip irrigation can change the desert. 65% of Israel production of, of vegetables comes from this area, and there's no rain there, less than 20 millimeters. So here the government decided to put people there, they drilled 400 to 1,000 meters down in order to get water, but then you can create agriculture. Same place, Aravad Desert Valley. You can see the mountain in the back, it's a bit difficult, but we're talking about real desert and see how nice the potatoes look like. The irrigate with drip irrigation, it's a dry air, so there's no diseases at all. So we have very good conditions for that. This is a project in, in Egypt, in Siwa region, uh, where we make a olive plantation. You can see it from the beginning, the way it looks. Now no one can do, this is desert. Only if you bring the water and you put it on the sand, which is a very aerated media, it's very good in one way, but then you can grow anything. So this is, you see, July 2007, June, and this is in 2009, and you can see now we have very full mature crops in the desert. Another test case, this is Laredo project in Peru, sugarcane in the desert. We're delivering the water for 56 kilometers. We talk about 99% sand in the, of the soil, pure sand. And still we get 180 tons, and if you try to do something without water, nothing will work. So this picture speaks for itself. In China, they grow a lot of cotton. Xinjiang province, they have about 2 million uh, hectare of cotton. What we do there, I, I didn't mean to put the, the netafim, it's not a commercial, but to see some kind of devices that people are using in order to, to drive drip irrigation into their fields. Uh, we have very short season. In the winter time, we talk about minus 30, 30 degrees. So we have about four months to grow the, the the cotton, so we seed it under mulch of plastic. It will keep the soil a little warm. And the drip zones are below, okay? This is subsurface drip irrigation. The drip zones are there waiting for the next season. This is the way it looks before we connect them. And this is the way it looks. We have sub, sub main pipe that gives water to both sides. Later we cover it and when you go on the field, you don't see anything. 
This is the way it looks with subsurface drip irrigation. This is the way it looks with flood irrigation. Anyone can see the difference if not a cotton grower. Uh, the results were very good. This is a hand-picked cotton. You will not see it in, the, in this kind of world, okay? But you see a very nice picture, very clean hand-picked. And the yields were very good. We were expecting to have the same yield, but we got 20% and more, and uh, it's still working. So another thing, when we are desert, we have sun, we can use it to pump the water. In some places, we don't have enough uh, energy. This is in India, for example. So we take solar panel. We can create different size of solar panel, different size of pumps for small farmers. And in places where no energy, it can work very beautifully. Uh, now I'll touch, we call it next revolution for drip irrigation is low flow dripper, okay? We wanted to make a cheaper system or less expensive, so we reduce the flow rate of the dripper. So all the sub mains, all the mains, all the pumps are coming uh, slower. Then we find there's a better water distribution, uh, better fertilizer availability, and we think this is the next jump in drip irrigation. For example, here you can see this is in Australia, it's a sandy dune, we grow uh, almonds over there. The dripper flow rate is 0 0.6 liter per hour, you see in the level, and we gave 3 mm of irrigation. The spacing between the dripper is 0 0.3 meters, and we can get a wet strap of 700 millimeters, 70 centimeters. We go down, it's the same hill. The, this, this, the flow is 2.3 liter per hour, okay, it's four times bigger flow. The dripper are 60 centimeters apart, it's not the same, but we get only 200. So now we can tell that with low flow, and coming the drip a bit closer, then we have a much better water, dis water distribution. Now, another thing, we, we, can use, we can use today the drip line as a delivery system, okay? It's not only water that's fertilized like it used to be before. Instead of uh, spraying chemicals in this way, we can put water through the, through the drip system. And you saw we talk about subsurface drip irrigation. So we sit in a very, a small root zone and we can apply any chemical, any bioagents, any beneficial things that we want. So it's a very great tool. It said that this syringe can do the same like this airplane is doing, okay? More or less. We need very small amount because we sit exactly in the middle of the root zone and we are very efficient. So when we use with drip irrigation, we can save water and fertilizer. Uh, we can give systemic plant protection, chemicals and non-chemicals, beneficial fungicides, herbicides all kind of bioalgies, uh, beneficial bacteria. So this, we have a tool, sits in the field, and we can use it, not only for water and fertilizer. Uh, another thing is crop management technology. How can we take all this data that is in the field and bring it to the computer today? Because the next generation of farmers will not go in muddy boots. It will be different. So we need to bring all the data to us. So this is a simple uh, system to say how much water we need. OK, evaporation pan. But today we have this kind of weather station that gives you radiation and wind speed and, and precipitation and can give you exactly how much water to give. Uh, tensiometers, very simple tools, and you can uh, see exactly where the water are reaching. You don't want to go for nitrate leaching, so you put in three depths and you know exactly where the water are. So we have many, many sensors. What sensor for water meter, sensor for tensiometer, this kind of uh, uh, weather station any kind of tanks, we can measure the height and get all the information. We don't need to go out to the field. So we call it CMT, crop management technology. We talked about before about rice, about the gas emission. We can do rice like this, okay? We worked for the last 10 years and now we have very good results in India, but we can grow rice with drip irrigation. It sounds crazy, but it works. We got very high yields now. Just recently we got yields in India of 10.5, 11 tons per hectare. And for us, it's a really uh, great uh, achievement. We can make dry seeding, no need to plant. We can, we can germinate with drip irrigation. We can plant machines. The drip lines are already subsurface over there. So we can drive the rice. Instead of getting very high gas emission, we can go for, for drip irrigation. Just an example, when a, when a government decides to do uh, food security, like in India, so this is project in Andhra Pradesh, Look about the size of it. We talk about 4,304,000 hectares. Look at the number of the farmers. They subsidized the drip irrigation scheme in 70 to 90 percent. And the farmers there became from very poor people to entrepreneurs. So by doing that well and going hand in hand, you need, you need to teach them. You have to train them. So if you do it right, the impact of such a project is, is unbelievable. 
you can see the amount of water saving, the increasing in yields, and, and for us this is a very big model, the way drip irrigation can change, can change the world actually. So, we can save water, increase yield, just, just for numbers, we can make double area in drip irrigation than in flood. The same amount of water or flood, we can do double area with drip irrigation. This is environmental irrigation, okay, we reduce the gas emission, we are not having any nitrate leaching, we talk about the low flow revolution, uh, drip is delivery system, we can use it. Maintenance is a must. It's not something that you can do without maintenance. But, and and in, in, let's say in the third world, it's difficult to, to change people's mind. But this is the way, otherwise it will not work.